we're here to talk about gaming for the greater good. I, one of the things I want to delve into is what that means. Is the greater good the right uh, moniker for this? That implied one thing, and then in reading through the, uh, uh, the topic, uh, clearly that's broader than what I think of as um, sort of colloquially the, the greater good, but we'll get into that in, in a few minutes. Let me let the panelists introduce themselves and what they do briefly. There will be points for clarity and brevity. And uh, and then we'll jump into some of the topics here. Uh, maybe I'll start with you, Molly. Clarity and brevity. Okay, Molly Kittle. I run the client services team at Bunchball. We're a company right down here in the valley. Um, we have about 50 large uh, enterprise customers who use our platform and our consulting services to add game mechanics and game dynamics to non-gaming environments. Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> Great. Um, my name is Nicole Lazaro, and uh, I'm a consultant in the uh, game industry. Uh, for the past 19 years, I've run Zeo Design, and essentially, I make games more fun. Uh, I'm most known for uh, having the audacity to ask the question, you know, can games uh, make us, you know, change how we feel? And I used, uh, uh, in 2000 or 2003, th 2004, I used Paul Ekman's facial action coding, where you measure emotions in the face to uh, really unlock what makes games fun. Um, so that's that's... That's what, that's what I do. Hi, my name is Mark Nelson. I uh, research mass collaboration and mass interpersonal persuasion here at the Stanford Persuasive Technology Lab. Um, and last year we also spun out an, a new lab, uh, Stanford Peace Innovation Lab, where we're essentially trying to take everything we know about um, using technology to elicit uh, desirable behaviors and uh, build a platform where we can measure how much impact we can have doing that. Good. I'm, I'm Byron Reeves. I'm a professor here at Stanford uh, in the Department of Communication. I'm a media psychologist. I do empirical experiments about how people think and feel in relation to uh, interesting features of interactive technology. The last six years, uh, uh, we've been uh, chasing the juicy features of uh, multiplayer games uh, in the lab. I'm also a co-founder of a, a startup called Seriosity. And we're trying to take game mechanics and game sensibilities and psychology uh, to the enterprise and figure out, pl figure out how to build a venue that is a game where people can go to work. And Byron, maybe we'll stick with you and uh, maybe you could just explain game dynamics. Broadly speaking, what are they and why do they work? And everybody can add in, but... Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm sure we'll all have our own list. Chapter four in Total Engagement uh, by Reeves and Reed uh, is, is, is our list. Uh, and, I, you know, I won't go through them all, but uh, there are mechanics that are reliably used in games that have been successful over the years to, that engage people. Uh, you started out with one of them, uh, uh, points for, uh, for brevity, uh, but uh, uh, levels, uh, 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 teams, uh, different features. Our list actually is that we tried to take from uh, the social science literature about how uh, these games work. So we're very interested in, in feedback and the time domains of feedback. Uh, games do really well in short time domains. Uh, uh, your your uh, workplace might do well in annual reviews or not even that well in, in, in that time scale. But so feedback is very interesting. This notion of social interaction in teams and cooperation as well as competition is very interesting. The, uh, the mechanic of self-representation, finding some way, maybe it's a full-blown avatar, uh, maybe it's some other way to represent yourself, but uh, vesting uh, uh, something of you in the interaction on the screen. Uh, is terribly engaging, and we know that because we're looking at uh, people's brains while they while they interact with avatars. So all these, I mean, uh, there's a long list. I don't know how uh, how long you want to uh, get this. There are lots of lists available, uh, but it's it's taking these mechanics from tried and true uh, uh, recipes in these games, and and I think this whole gamification uh, exercise is really. Uh, figuring out how we can take them and drop them in other contexts other than just entertainment where eyeballs are the criterion and, and try to come up with some other metrics to, to apply them to. I have a shorter list. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, in terms of game mechanics, um, and really, I really love your guys' book and the work that you do. Uh, what we've done by looking at people's faces uh, is we uh, uh, found that people playing everything from Tetris to Halo, homeschool and work, young and old, you know, Diner Dash, Worlds of Warcraft, uh, we found that, you know, player, we basically, we videotaped them and uh, looked at those favorite moments and organized them by um, 
uh, by emotion. So we had these emotion clusters. We had four basic groups, and we looked at those emotions, and well, what were the similarities and types of, the types of choices players were making? And it turns out that games tend to engage us, uh, best-selling games, uh, in four ways. The first way is uh, what we call hard, uh, well, usually it's the first one is the hook. It's the novelty. It pulls you in. We call it easy fun. It's, you know, basically just being able to drive around the track or maybe drive the racetrack backwards, throw all your sims in the pool, pull out the ladder. Driven by curiosity, wonder, and surprise. You've done that, yeah. <laughs> yeah I've done it, too. <laughs> uh, the second one is hard fun, which is all about challenge and mastery. So it's, the, it's basically it's that frustration, well, yeah, because that basketball hoop is way up there and it's really small, uh, that leads to this feeling of winning, like, yes, you know, I, I got the boss monster. I won the Grand Prix. Uh, no word in English for that emotion, so um, I, use, uh, I use Fiero, you know, the Italian for, you know, like, yes, I got it. your body's on fire. That's what, how I visualize it. And, uh, you know, that's goals, obstacles, and challenges, and, and obviously points. Uh, the, the third one is the uh, ability to uh, socialize around games. So we found the games, a lot of emotions in games, best moments in games happened in a social context. Games are excuse, an excuse to hang out with your friends. So you have what we call people fun, which has amusement and schadenfreude, which is the joy you feel uh, when your rival experiences misfortune. You also have nachas, which is a Yiddish term for that pleasure and pride when someone you help succeeds. Lots of great emotions, more emotion in people fun than in the other three combined. And uh, people playing the same room have more emotions than, play, th than playing the same game in different rooms. A lot of social interaction around that, so not surprising. I mean, we released this model in 2004. It took us a while to get on Facebook and actually get some good social games. Um, but, uh, you know, so that's where we're at. And the last one is, of course, serious fun. And uh, the serious fun uh, is, the, the serious fun key is all about uh, the ability for a game to actually change how I think and feel and behave. After the game is done, I've gotten some reward. And it's, sometimes it's a badge, but more importantly, it's now I'm smarter, or I've lost weight because I play DDR, or that I'm, you know, closer to my friends, or some value that that game experience creates. Players enjoy games that actually change, change how, they, um, how they are. All games teach. Um, so it's, those, are the, those are kind of the four keys. And then, Mark, I had a question for you, and I'll bring it back to you, Molly. Um, is this multicultural? Are these, um, you know, fundamental ways people think and behave and react, or have you found that not to be the case? So um, there are levels of this that are basic biology. Um, we don't think of ourselves this way very often, but we human beings are actually a herd animal. We're right in there with the gazelles and the zebras and so forth. And um, that means we're, we're hardwired to collaborate and cooperate much more than we are hardwired to fight with each other. Um, and so if you, if you want to trigger those endorphin hits and, and oxytocin uh, jolts and so on, um, if you're coming at this from a business perspective, you, sh you should think of yourself as a drug dealer dealing legal drugs, and you should be thinking about how do I trigger what biology has been hardwiring into us for millions of years in terms of social bonding, the, this feeling of connectedness, the feeling of being part of something greater than ourselves. Um, all of those things are deeply wired into, into our biology. I, I agree, but I think I disagree on the drug dealer part. <laughs> <laughs> legal, legal drug dealer. <laughs> well, I think I think that what you, what I do is I really draw from the patterns, and then I you know model a pattern you know in the real world to you know model what you know model a game mechanic around it. And um, if uh, if you go too hard, like if you create a Skinner box, Skinner boxes work. They're very reliable, very predictable. But if you create a Skinner boxes, Skinner boxes, it will have the behavior, but it doesn't. They're not fun. You know, you're just addicted to the game. And it's actually then caused a lot of pain. So you have to be careful if you go to yeah. And so Molly, that was uh, really leads nicely into my next question, which was, does it have to be fun? No, it, it doesn't have to be fun in the sense of, that we think of fun. Um, I think enjoyable, uh, it, satisfying, gratifying. Fun, I think, has, frankly, has gotten a bad rap. Um, fun can be uh, scary to a banking website. Fun can be scary to um, a CEO who's trying to increase productivity in the workforce. By um, that you mean the term fun? The term fun can yes, be, okay. yes. Mm -hmm. But the innate human fun, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, so I guess it's important to, to differentiate between the word and the emotion. Mm -hmm. um, well, that's one of the things that really, when we did our research about fun, was mm -hmm. so interesting and why I wanted to say, well, people were banding about this term, fun. Well, what is that? Mm -hmm. um, and it, we really mapped it more towards engagement, you know, because there's a way of engagement. But that, it's interesting that hard fun is different than easy fun. It's like hard fun is actually, you know, a, a, my favorite player quote is, you know, a wife of a hardcore piece of gaming. She says, I always know how my husband feels about a game. If he screams, I hate it, I hate it, I hate it, I know <laughs> two things. A, he's going to finish it. 
and B is gonna buy version two. Mm. <laughs> So when we have fun, we are often working. We are often experiencing a lot of frustration. In fact, the only way the arms go up for a nice Fiero is when you're so frustrated, you're about ready to throw that mobile phone or whatever it is out the window. Uh, and that's when, and you succeed at that point. That's when, that's when you win. Um, so I mentioned the topic is gaming for the greater good. Is that a good topic? We're talking about a variety of things here. When I read that topic, I thought this was for social change in the um, NPO sense of the world, not business, not necessarily education. Is gaming for the greater good um, if we, the I, right? I would want to argue with that. Just okay. like, you know, the only way we're going to get greater good is if we change business. Mm. I mean, it's got to be integrated. Um, I follow a lot of what Kevin Jones says on this, and it's sort of like he has this metaphor of, you know, you, you work at an office, you know, for part of the day, or for all of the day, you come home with money in your pocket. You then go to a charity, and then you know you, in one in one pocket, and then you put you know you hand another pocket and pull out money to give to the charity to uh, reverse the damage that was done by the the hours you put in at the office. So I think something about that system could be a little bit more optimized, perhaps a little more efficient. But <laughs> so I don't buy the the complete bifurcation. But yeah. Well, I think there's um. We're just looking at a narrow slice of this, I and mean, we we built on a lot of Byron's work on engagement. Um, we realized at some point in the, in the Peace Innovation Lab that um, if you look at positive engagement, and, and there's some buckets of that, you know, you've got to get people from ignoring each other. We'll ignore the negative side of engagement, how to reduce conflict. But if you just get people from ignoring each other to being aware of each other, to paying attention, to communicating, these, these are all things we can measure. We can measure the quality and the quantity of those kind of interactions. Um, a little bit of coordination, a little bit of cooperation. Each one enables the next layer, basically. When you get out to collaboration, where you have people doing things for mutual benefit, um, that's a really good proxy for peace for us. And, and that's completely measurable and quantifiable in, in lots of beautiful ways. Um, and this, the more work that gets done in web-based platforms, um, the more hard metrics we have about um, exactly what's possible there. I don't know how many of you have seen the work we did with Facebook. but. Um, we can measure um, interactions that, that are directly representative of, of some aspect of peace in really interesting ways. So just for example, 67,113 Pakistanis and Indians friended each other on Facebook yesterday. We, we never had that kind of data before. You know? That precision, that scale, um, uh, and that dynamic, like uh, they could give us trailing data by the minute if we, if we asked for it. So um, yeah, I think there's, there's huge potential here to change the world for the good in really interesting ways. I think, and I think um, game mechanics is a, a toolbox that we simply have never had before that I think takes us pretty close to a new human superpower. Um, in, the, in the same way, what I mean by that is, in the same way that for most of history, we were looking up, up at the birds going, oh, if only we could fly like the birds, but we can't. And then a hundred and some years ago, suddenly technology came together in interesting ways. And suddenly, within a decade, we were flying further and faster and carrying more than any species ever. Um, that's what I mean by a new human superpower. I think we are on the verge of that kind of potential for collective action. I, mean, I think just to add to a couple more examples, one of our clients um, uh, builds a game on Facebook called uh, it's a, called Happy Oasis. It takes place in the Middle East. Uh, and you click on camels instead of cows. And if you can imagine, 60% um, of the uh, uh, population in the Middle East is under the age of 24. Can you imagine the sort of, you know, the, the kinds of changes that you could actually make through, you know, in terms of collaborative, you know, game mechanics, uh, you know, in that, you know, with, with, that, with that kind of population, you could actually uh, create social bonds that cross tribal lines. And I think that's, um, that's, that's really amazing that what we, what we might be able to do. And in fact, what uh, you know, games have always led uh, the interface design industry uh, in terms of new interfaces. So we've always, you know, there were pie menus in The Sims. There was gestures on the Wii. You know, there's voice control. All of these things have happened in games first. So it's it's there's no question in my mind that the even if a, if we can't have a specific game, you know, that actually changes the world, we're going to be able to prototype. Uh, you know, new types of dynamics, new superpowers uh, to create uh, new ways, new days, ways of dealing with each other. I mean, the game that we're working on right now uh, with my company, which is called uh, Tilt Flips Adventure in 1.5 Dimensions, 
And uh, I've used these model, the model of four keys, to fund to actually I created the first uh, game on the iPhone and used the accelerometer uh, with Joe Hewitt at iPhone Dev Camp. And uh, we've now got a, a bigger version of the game on the iPad, which I can show you later if you like. Um, and what you do is you earn till points by eating carbon out of the air and gathering, plant, planting seeds. Those till points are geocoded, so we've got people playing from here to Shanghai. And now we're partnering with companies to do things in the real world. So like with the, the Vermont uh, Energy Investment Company, they're a line item on the Vermont Energy Bill. Mm -hmm. We're actually taking some of their, we're actually you know, working on some games to uh, actually have people do stuff in the real world to conserve energy. They earn points in the game. Uh, so there's some, there's some that, real interesting powers. That yeah. uh, was where I wanted to go yeah. next, and this is really relevant to everybody, I'd like, because you have different perspectives on it, but are we talking primarily about online or a combination of, of online and offline? And I know, Byron, that's near and dear to some of the things you're doing, so maybe yeah, you can talk I, about Yeah, I actually it. think one of the more interesting uh, uh, developments in the games is the, is the, the blurring of that distinction between Absolutely. online and offline, and this is terribly engaging. When you... If you turn off the lights in your house, a smart meter recognizes that electrical use is down, uh, and through uh, that data is transferred to a, to your game screen, and you get 10 points on your iPhone, or the carbon monster dies, or or whatever it is. We've uh, worked on that game as well. Then your house becomes a joystick for play on a screen in media. And the same in transportation and health. Uh, if it's a a, a blood test, uh, uh, insulin. T uh, related test uh, uh, and adolescents are cooperating uh, to, to, to uh, see what group can have the best uh, uh, scores uh, in, in compliance, that can be input into the game as well. And transportation driving, there's lots of interesting uh, new uh, uh, car uh, uh, possibilities for games because there are sensors in the world that are providing automatically a lot of data about what's going on. So you get this blurring and that is terribly engaging. I mean, there's no I mean, as part of our, our work here over the last 20 years, there's no switch in the brain that 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 flips when you go from real life to to mediated life, and so it's it's very important to to recognize that that blurring can really create a lot of that engagement. So I'm I'm very high on the ability to if you're if you're working in a company and what you do on your screen, how you resolve a call that's come into a call center influences how your team does in a virtual game. I mean, that can be a very uh, engaging uh, blurring of those two worlds. So I really like that uh, possibility for, for new games. How are you applying it, Molly? Uh, there's a couple of different ways we're applying it, and then also in, in, the, uh, in the industry, Opower is a company that's not a customer of ours, but I find what they're doing comp incredibly compelling because it's the, it's the now version of the dream that Byron just, uh, that you just, just uh, mentioned. So when any, any, when anytime we pay attention to what someone's doing, they optimize for the metric that we're measuring. And Opower just basically gives you a, a, a point of reference where you sit in relation to others in your neighborhood in terms of energy consumption. Um, you either are consuming less or more, and if you're consuming more, you get a sad face, and if you're consuming less, you get a happy face. Mm -hmm. And so people are changing their behavior to optimize for the happy faces. Um, and uh, and that's, that's a, a great example of something very offline, but incredibly tangible and impactful mm -hmm. and non-complex. Um, the, the other point I wanted to make about uh, employee productivity Byron, you mentioned uh, you, want, you want people in a call center to answer more calls. There's a company we work with called LiveOps, and they have a distributed call center. These employees aren't actually employees. They're contractors. So LiveOps has no ability to mandate that they take training, that they show up to work. And so how do you organize and corral a workforce that is uncontrollable? Um, and they've used game mechanics and game concepts to help them do that by rewarding users for taking training, getting certifications, displaying their badges. Other uh, call center employees can look at badges and, and, and proficiency and come to certain people with questions. So they're really motivating a community, even though it's distributed. The, the, it strikes me that motivating force, organizing force, scoring mechanism, what have I missed in the... Well, I would add that you, know, you do have to be careful, especially with scoring. Uh, mm -hmm. Points are what unbalances Twitter, and in fact, you know, this gamification idea can actually kill. Okay, if you remember, if you've ever uh, driven across the Bay Bridge, you know that they've introduced, the, des the game designers on the Bay Bridge have introduced a variable toll rate to encourage off rush hour travel, off peak travel, which actually works. You know, pe more people drive when it's not rush hour. But don't be on the Bay Bridge at you know at that toll plaza at 6:59 p.m. on a Friday night, 
because literally there'll be dozens of cars pulled over on the median. People stopped in the active high in the active lane, looking at the scoreboard, waiting for that toll to drop from six dollars to four dollars. <laughs> you know, it basically, if you give people a score, they will optimize to you know they'll basically change their behavior to optimize it. But then there are secondary effects, and so when you're a game designer, that secondary effect, those tertiary effects, that's all what goes that what, that all goes into into games. The other thing too is the um, uh, games also have, each choices in the games have emotion profiles. So like, uh, you know, with the iPhone, uh, it's a very social device, which is, which is great. Uh, and it's really genius what they did on the operating system. Because like, if I were to take my iPhone and share my photos with you, well, you know, we would, what would you do? You would, well, you would tap, you'd pinch, you zoom, right, to look at the photos. Well, you do those same gestures, but on the back of my hand, you know, we'd better be on a date or something because there's so much social emotion, meaning, in those gestures, and how lovely for a social device, you know, to actually map those into, into the platform. So game design is not just about points, but it's creating these player experiences, these emotional experiences that people, um, that people go to. There's, and there's no wonder, if you think of the, what are the top Facebook games, you know, since the beginning, they've always involved people, plants, and pets. All of those mechanics, uh, all of those mechanics are, you know, engendered, caretaking kind of things. It has nothing to do with points and badges. I mean, they're definitely, there's, there's definitely good mechanics there, but there's other stuff happening that creates uh, something that really matches that social platform. Um, Mark and Byron, um, what is this, uh, these game dynamics, the application of game dynamics, how do they affect leadership and what skills leaders need to have, how they approach leadership and and then also, you know, beyond leaders, the folks that leaders are interacting with. Yeah, so we did a, a year-long study. Uh, I did this with Tom Malone. It was an HBR piece about a year and a half ago, uh, looking at leadership in the more complex uh, multiplayer game. So this is a World of Warcraft version, where we, we actually went to uh, uh, IBM, uh, got permission uh, uh, to ask uh, middle-level executives to fess up that they'd spent 500 hours uh, leveling up to level 70 and were leaders of an online guild and making websites and doing recruiting and performance reviews and whatnot in these complex guilds. And we actually looked at, at how leadership uh, happened in those, in those guilds and how it compared to real life. And a couple headlines are, are really interesting. One is that, uh, so first of all, these are substantial organizations that happen in these games. This is not uh, Farmville type, type play. This is more sophisticated play but it's uh, worthy of emulating, I think. Um, so these are substantial organizations that are over months and even years that in, can involve tens and hundreds of people uh, in a hierarchy with uh, sharing mechanisms, performance reviews, as I mentioned, uh, and a, uh, a need to uh, settle disputes and whatnot. One of the things that the games provide that really influenced ideas about leadership is enough metrics, enough quantification, enough information, enough transparency about expertise, about how people are doing, about who contributed what to, to the raid, even uh, your damage per second or your contributions per time unit. There was enough information that leadership seemed to be more a property of the environment of the games than of an intrinsic quality uh, of the individuals that were doing the leading. So it's not you're born to lead and we just need to find the right ones and mentor them, but it's uh, you lead now, I'll lead tomorrow, uh, you seem to be doing better on this task, you go. So uh, leadership uh, happened very quickly, uh, or transitions happened very quickly, and the environment became a, a, a substantial part of that, uh, that, that, that leadership, which is really uh, uh, kind of an optimistic uh, uh, view of leadership that if you provide enough transparency, if everybody knows what's going on, uh, first of all, everybody can be a better follower. So leadership is a little bit easier in that, in that respect as well. So imagine, uh, so what we've done is imagine taking that transparency that happens in, in World of Warcraft and dropping it on um, uh, a large uh, national retail sales chain. What if all 200,000 people that worked in your company knew everything about the sales activities of those 200,000 people? So you could find out uh, you know, the, 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 
the guy at the jewelry counter in Akron, Ohio, and, and you know what fantasy team he was on and uh, or she was on and what uh, points were being collected, uh, teams being formed, uh, uh, quests being uh, so, and, and that transparency really has an interesting uh, uh, opportunity to open up leadership. So it's not that supervisor, but I know what you're trying to do. You've got a hard job supervising us all. I'll help out, and and, and our team will win, and I get to share in in in, in the uh, spoils of the team victory. Yeah. How much how much of that do you think was uh, also uh, could, uh, how much of the factor that you were actually in a play environment? Do you think that that helped? How did that influence? You know, you're in a play environment, so it doesn't really matter if I fail as a leader. How, many, how big a role did that play in these, well, the fact this that mushrooming the, of Yeah, that's a good skills? question. The fact that failure doesn't quite hurt as much is, I think, Im important. But, uh, and, and it may hurt even less because it is in a play environment, but, but it can hurt. Uh, if I've got 100 friends uh, that, that I'm playing with and I look bad in the raid, that's a that's a knock, and it and it's every bit a real knock, and it's uh, I'm I'm going to be depressed in my social relationships that evening, uh, uh, equal to a, a bad day at work. So th that th the social part of it is 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 very much there, even though it is is a play environment. And what the what the uh, uh, managers are about uh, several hundred managers that we interviewed at IBM, what they said was. I believe it's the same thing. It's the same process. I'm taking things from the game world and applying it at work and vice versa. Yeah. Well, and I mean, in that context, this is all, that's all volunteer labor, so to speak. That's people taking their free time, not time they're being paid with. And if you fail them yeah. as a leader in that context, it doesn't have certain ramifications, but it certainly has other ramifications. You don't get to keep your position because you have a title and there's an org structure, you are only there by virtue of people saying, we will follow you. Well, it might be an interesting <laughs> thing to do in real life if that wasn't the case as well. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think just to um, add and maybe nuance this a little bit, the leadership is becoming much more collaborative. That's really clear. Um, and the, the pieces of that that seem to be really important are about it's much more now about creating an environment that people want to come be part of. And so, so leadership ability suddenly becomes much more about nurturing, about pushing from behind, about supporting your people, about pushing them forward, providing a platform for them, providing a spotlight for them, getting out of their way. Th those all seem to be really identifying factors. And this is, I've been going through this personally. I mean, when I uh, retired from banking, it was early 90s. And it was very much a command and control organization. People did what I said because I paid them, and damn it, if they didn't, I fired them, you know? Um, it, that doesn't work anymore, especially in, a, in an organization where you have a whole bunch of volunteers working for you because they just love the project and they, and they care about what you're doing. Um, so that, that's been culture shock. There's one other issue, though, and, and that is a whole lot of things that we used to think were leadership are actually management and administration. Those things are getting embedded in software. Those jobs are going away. And anybody who thinks that's leadership should be paying attention to the fact that that's getting architected into the game mechanics. Mm -hmm. And there won't be people doing that anymore. And that will be a good thing, because now all the politics that goes with those kinds of gatekeeper jobs is becoming much more transparent in, in the software mm -hmm. itself. People trust software more than they trust people <laughs> in, that, in that situation. An interesting thing, theme that I'm pulling out of that too, as far as like what is a, a core game mechanic, is that you know games are, and what fascinates, it's what pulled me into games from the very, very beginning, is that games are. I did a lot of user interface design, you know, for you know Roxio and you know a number of different other companies. Um, and uh, what was interesting, Oracle and that sort of thing, is that we get um, uh, games are self-motivating tasks. You know, there is nobody, you know, holding a, you know, a, you know, performance bonus or something like that for you to learn Photoshop. I mean, for for you to learn World of Warcraft. You know, you are paid to, to learn Photoshop, and so there's a lot of interesting. If you look at games for their interfaces and what is it that they do, it creates this nice, um, you know, this nice, this nice self-motivating. And that's, you know, how do we, you know, how do we master challenges like with hard fun? We can actually use these games to figure out well, how do we apply some of these things, take them out of games, and then put them in. Into, um, thing, uh, into, into the work itself. So for example, I just gave a talk at the Game Developers Conference and in this, um, uh, for, the smart, uh, for the Smartphone Summit, and what I did was I, I threw up a slide with, you know, like this futuristic, you know, like what would a task look like? 
And uh, one of the parts I most like is just we should have like this little distraction radar, like a heads up display for an interruption that's coming, but before, so I can squash it before, uh, <laughs> before it gets to me. Now, we don't want to actually like maybe actually visualize it that way, but there's a lot of ways that we're going to be able to change how we work and, and the tools in which we work with. You know, they're really, you know, they're really, we're basically like we're, we're implementing flashcards right now. And the, the tools we're going to have in the next generation, they're going to be much more responsive to what naturally motivates, motivates us as people. And that's, I think, the key is that this is all about what naturally motivates us. And this is the tool set on top of those natural mm -hmm. motivators that extracts them, puts them to use in whatever type of environment for whatever type of goal. Yeah, and if you, if you think about it, you know, cubicles, I mean, let's face it, you know, cubicles are cages for people. If the workplace were a zoo, the Humane Society would shut it down in an hour because it's not suited, for, it, it fails to provide the mental furniture for people to do their work. We spend so much time you know, in Facebook because all social, ex you know, social interaction has been extracted from the task. We spend so much, um, you know, we, we, um, we, 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 we caffeinate ourselves because the work is, fails to engage us. And so we can look at things that, you know, software that does engage us for these cues and what is it about this? You know, how does, it, how does WOW work? You know, how do we get leaders that way? And we're gonna change the way the, the workplace works. That brings me back around to sort of an earlier topic I'd like to dig into a little bit more. Just this idea that we've, they're, they're game dynamics and we've made that this big thing and some of these are fundamental and they're cross-cultural and all that, but applied to a business context versus a um, more social organization. Business context versus some of the work, you know, peace studies. Some of those applications versus educational applications, are they the same? Are we retargeting the same tools or are they different? I mean, how, what are some of the tools that you all use at Bunchball versus, Mark, some of the tools that you think about or the, the ways you apply it? Um, we haven't talked really about education at all. Maybe we can dig in. I'll just sort of open that up. But I'd like to get a level deeper on those. I think all of us are talking about recognition, transparency, feedback, and all of these things work very well in, I think, any environment we can think of where human beings are interacting with work, with play, socially. Um, all the, the tools that I use on a day-to-day -day basis for customers uh, seem a little bit um, uh, tan more tangible than the, than the ideas behind them. Uh, but I point points that you mentioned, levels, leaderboards, badges. But those things in and of themselves, that's not the weight. That's not the importance. And that's not the motivating factor. They tap into what's already happening inside of us. So uh, you brought up a good point earlier that and if you're not if you're not a good choice architect, then you're going to set yourself up and your users up for failure. So it's all about designing the experience and taking into consideration, yes, your business goals, you have to make money. There is an end goal for the business. But there's also, almost more importantly, the people that are driving your business, generating revenue, um, ROI for you, we can talk about that and we can, you know, thinking about how we're measuring and collecting data, telling that, the return on investment story for engagement. All of those things are important, but you won't have a return on investment unless you're thinking very seriously about the user experience, how they're interacting with the um, either the website, the application, the game, whatever it might be, and, and what they want, what their identity is, who they are, and what motivates them. You asked earlier about um, do these things uh, impact everyone in, in a similar way or are different types of people impacted differently. We're, we're all uniquely individual, but we do have a common motivating factor. We all do want to be recognized, and we all are looking for feedback. And, and I think that what we've ignored for years, for, no, for decades, is that the importance of play in mm -hmm. as human beings, especially in the developed world. Uh, I, I grew up, I spent half of my childhood overseas, and it's quite clear to me that these, um, that we've really relegated play to, you know, sort of this outside, that's just for kids, not us, but all games teach, and play is actually really all mammals play. Play is a very important part in the learning process, whether it's, you know, learning your ABCs or learning how to, you know, create a balance sheet. Uh, and so our tools don't, don't allow us to play. Uh, but if you wanted to, take it into, here's some, some guidelines, is what I do to create a game out of anything is you want to sim first uh, simplify the world. Uh, you then can clarify the goals. That'll tap into Shiksent Mahai's flow, you know, so if you look, look up him as well. Uh, and then you want to amplify the feedback. Mint.com works so well is because you can set those goals and wow, I've never seen progress, you know, like bars 
chart like that. Just they're so fat, <laughs> very like you know. And, but you feel if you you can really feel your your progress along the way. And to that um, and to that purpose, I've also shared uh, white papers on my website, and uh, I'll I'll let you guys in too. Uh, I just gave, I just opened this URL for the game developers up in uh, San Francisco. Uh, it's uh, called uh, 4K2F, Four Key Stefan, just 4K2F.com, uh, and that's routing you to an, a new page, and you can actually download what I call Game, uh, G-A-M-E. Uh, it's basically the game plan, and you can create a game plan uh, to save the world. And what is a game? But it's goals, actions, motivators, and emotions. So G-A-M-E, and there's a little spreadsheet: people cause change. So there are 13 questions that you answer. And you can do it in about 15 minutes. You can create a new game to save whatever part of the world you want to. So how many of you guys are actually social entrepreneurs or want to be social entrepreneurs? Again, just So the, the thing, one thing to pay attention to that's really interesting here is this toolbox of gamification allows you to look at something that wouldn't normally be thought of as business mm -hmm. and start actually quantifying what, what value is. And so... Um, a lot of people look at what we're doing and say, peace innovation, isn't that charity or philanthropy or else government diplomacy? Turns out, actually, it's not. It's business. Um, we can go in. Um, we're working on a pilot right now with partner cities focused on gang violence. And we can start mapping what impact gang violence has on property values and on the tax base and on mortgage portfolios of banks and lenders and on insurance claims. We can start quantifying that in a great deal of detail and saying, this is exactly how much this problem is costing you as a property owner and you as a community member and you as a business. And we can identify the businesses where that pain aggregates. Then we can go to them and make a very interesting pitch about how we can minimize their risk or actually increase the value of their portfolio, et cetera. So pay attention to that kind of model because this toolbox allows you to go look at things that were traditionally in the nonprofit. we can't figure out how to do business there, we can't figure out how to make the markets work there. Uh, things were traditionally in that domain suddenly become really interesting new business propositions when you have this kind of a toolbox. If you, if you, if you, I, I just wanted to pick up, I think that's a great question of what's the difference between the social uh, metrics and criteria and business criteria and whatnot. I want to uh, make a little bit of an admission, I think we'd all have to, that an interest in serious games is really an interest in a portfolio of tools and solutions looking for problems <laughs> to solve. And, and the same basket of stuff can be used to make a call center work better, to uh, have volunteers contribute on a, a, a website, uh, uh, get people to reduce energy use. So it, it really is, but each of those different metrics and, and problems are rad can be radically different. And there's an alignment process that where you, where you bring your bag of stuff that works in, in games, the ingredients for different recipes. And you really have to spend a lot of time asking about exactly what in this call center is going well and not well, and what are we trying to optimize and minimize, and align those metrics. And it's really a difficult process. It's not just a you know, throw a, throw a leaderboard, uh, a point system, a, a, a narrative, uh, teams, etc., against the wall. There, there's really, especially in the more complex, and, and, and I, I, I would venture in, in the future the most successful applications, that alignment process is, re there's really a lot of thinking that goes along. I mean, I, I would, if I were making the call center game, I'd have a game designer and three call center guys. <laughs> Uh, uh, on that on that team or about that about that ratio, and the same with with some of these other social metrics. I mean, thinking about energy use, for example, and reducing energy energy use. It's yeah, points kind of work, and, you know, without much consideration. But it'll work a lot better if you know uh, a lot about that a lot about that behavior. So that that conversation about defining the behaviors associated with the changes that you want, finding the metrics that can be automatically input into the game, finding a way to recognize those behaviors, what do you want people to do more of, less of, about the same of, uh, is really a tough process still. How many of you have a Prius and have played the Leaf game? Yes so, on the first, right. no on the second. <laughs> yeah, so you basically, you know, you get these little leaves for, you know, you know, being more eco-friendly, as it were. And that's a game, but it's like kind of subtly baked into, you know, the design of a car. And um, you know, so, yes, you, get, you need to get the business case up and have a business model so your business runs. But then you also now, well, now how do we make it, how do we make it fun? And I argue is that what we're really looking at is how can we understand and even change the human architecture 
that underlies the stuff that we're doing. It underlies, it provides us, games are going to provide us these windows into changing how we think, feel, and behave. It'll create new tools for thought, allow us to design, you guys to all design, new tools for thought. And if you think about it, what we really need, you know, to, you know, cure AIDS, to end global warming, to, um, you know, uh, bring on, you know, conflict resolution, to resolve conflict resolution, is we need to be, learn how to chase wonder. We need a discovery machine. So, you know, adding more curiosity, wonder, surprise to, like Google. Google already does this with the wonder wheel. Uh, we need to be able to add more, um, you know, create a self-motivating task, you know, using understanding hard fun, like challenge and obstacles and goals, how that works. We also need to create empathy engines. So what we would take that next step is like, yes, you've got the property value argument, but then now how do we create empathy? And how do we, how do we, um, how do we, what kinds of mechanics increase empathy? Or, you know, what, what would do, what would do that? And then, um, you know, finally we've got, you know, being able to create eco simulations because James Paul Geese has a wonderful book on what games can teach us on video game, um, about learning literacy. And he says, if you master the simulation, you master the content. Has anybody played um, like, uh, you know, SimCity? SimCity, yeah, yeah. All right, so after you played SimCity, I don't know, for me, like it was like, you know, you know, uh, you know I was up till three in the morning at the office, it was the only game, that, that, the only computer that would run it, and then I went home and I, and I drove to work the next day, but it was in this surreal state, only a couple hours sleep, but like, wow, power lines, sewer, oh, you know, and then the whole world, a whole world that had been completely, that had been there my entire life, was now suddenly new. You know, I come back from a, you know, playing rock band with my friends, drive across the San Mateo Bridge, and I'm playing guitar, right, for that. And I, you can literally, I can literally see all eight lanes of traffic, every car in both directions. So there's something really interesting. We don't understand what games are doing for us, but I think that that's the next generation. That's what it's all up to you, is to take what we're learning in games, take, you know, take what you enjoy about games, and applying it to these other contexts. Well, that rolls nicely into, I want to sort of push it out to get some thoughts and questions, but not just questions, I mean some interaction, and are there areas that you all would like to ask about, about the topic, but also some particular areas of um, uh, greater good that we could talk about and kind of do gaming at the improv here and talk through how, how would you do that? And I've got one that's a little tangential, and that is that you know, Machinima took game engines and made movies using these games. Is there the possibility, as opposed to designing a game specifically or game dynamics specifically around um, particular goals, could we take some problems we want to solve and plug them sort of in the back end into things that happen at, in Warcraft? I mean, if you're trying to solve protein folding problems or logistical problems, could you in fact sort of program these in without changing what anybody does in World of Warcraft where, or the topic said, three billion hours a week in play, is there a way to solve some problems that happens transparently? Has anybody tried to do anything like that? You know, we, uh, Would that be um, the, the answer is maybe controversial, uh, I suppose. Yeah, the answer is maybe. There was a game called Star Wars Galaxies when we first started thinking about uh, uh, applications in the enterprise. And in Star Wars Galaxies, uh, to survive in the game, uh, you had to make stuff. You had to take on a job, and you had to make it, uh, uh, market it, uh, sell it. Uh, uh, do the whole, whole thing. And, and these were very sophisticated jobs. And there was a job called, uh, within the doctor category, called pharmaceutical manufacturer. And we're playing this game and showing this game to a bunch of scientists at Eli Lilly. And in this, who, who were interested in gaming because they had pain points about collaborative uh, science that were very significant in, in their development. And in this game, you have to search the galaxy for interesting catalysts for chemical reactions. You had to actually dock molecules and, uh, and think. So it wasn't quite the real science, but it was so close. Uh, uh, and, and all the points in the marketing and, and the whole uh, wrapper around the game could remain the same if you could actually. And they just went to town thinking about uh, a very sophisticated collaborative activity. This is not just, not something, not a simple behavior. This is uh, over, over a significant amount of time and actually spend some time trying to think about exactly what that would mean and, and uh, doing a lot of other, uh, uh, getting a lot of other advantages in there as well, getting a little bit of wisdom of crowds involved. Uh, uh, the leadership issue is very important. If you uh, are working uh, at Lilly and you invented Prozac, you're the only guy that gets to talk in the room. Uh, and all the young scientists don't get to talk one of the games. That's, you know, who cares what you did last week? Uh, 
so there were some really interesting things that came of that. And the games all, in, all have, I mean, Warcraft has a thousand APIs mm -hmm. uh, in and out. So you can, there, there's, there's a, a creative, there's a sandbox there for somebody to play. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad you've mentioned that. To, to, to reverse that, not to, not to spend another $100 million building a, a Warcraft uh, that, that'll do scientific collaboration, but actually build that in. So you can go to leadership boot camp in, in, uh, uh, in Warcraft now, working for a company. So instead of you know, going to a, uh, the ropes course uh, and you know, getting closer there, why don't, uh, this, this is one guild, this is another guild, and another guild, and we're gonna uh, uh, square off you know, and see, see if we can get the farthest. And it periodically, at the right moments, we'll tell you a little bit about uh, leadership and how group dynamics, but uh, it's, it's play. So I think it's a great uh, thought. Are there some, so let me push it back out here. Um, yes? Yeah, um, well, so far, it, everything's been really fascinating to see these examples where game dynamics are used in our lives and we don't even realize. Um, and I wanted to ask, uh, what's been your experience in differentiating in finding what it is about certain people that don't get hooked by games. Um, you know, and I'll, I'll count myself like in that. You know, my, my younger brother, you know, is, probably spends like 16 hours a day uh, on like three different simultaneous games online. And for the life of me, um, you know, I've n never got into Farmville or, or any of these other things. Although I just realized that I compete with my wife on who can get the best mileage mm. on her, <laughs> on her car. Um, so, so, like, what is it, you know, about that, those, those barriers that, that, that come up? Just looking at those two examples, I would say uh, you are playing games all the time. You just, they're, they're more in line with your social norms and reality, and you don't crave escapism as much. It's not that you don't respond to those game mechanics or dynamics, it's that you're doing them in your own life and you're, and you're playing in your own life. That example you gave was great. I mean, people who really want to do well in school, who want to be recognized, who want to speak on panels. I mean, there's, uh, there are a lot of human, human, innate human desires that manifest themselves all the time. Um, so, yeah. I think I would add to that, uh, in the research that we've done, uh, we've been, you know, interviewing players. I've been interviewing players for 20 years. So. I, and one thing that, I, that I've learned is that one, the number one reason why people don't play games, and this is interviewing people in their homes, they have perfect access, they got someone to show them, why, why, why are you not playing? Why? why? And uh, you know, usually it's just, just too addictive. You know, one of my favorite quotes in this, along this line is, uh, you know, I don't play his kind of games because somebody has to remember to take care of the kids. <laughs> And so it's an interesting point, and we are, and, I, and I've been talking about this for, you know, for the past three years or so, four years ago, in a sense that, you know, we're, if you get, you know, if you create a system that unbalances the human, you know, a lot of them are going to reject. And so actually, you know, by just trying to drive your, you know, your, your DAUs or, you know, the, week, the, week, the numbers of hours per week, you can actually do in the long term your business, your brand, your game disservice because if they have to, if they have to pull out, it's often like cold turkey. No, I have to, you know, I have to finish my MBA. I'm not playing War Warcraft anymore. Uh, we've had lots of interviews with that. And we've had people, you know, people talk about the people that monetize on Facebook, you know, those, those really, you know, $900 a month. I mean, no, sorry, $900 a year, sorry, that was, that was insane. Uh, $900 a year, uh, that's still insane on virtual goods. Like, what are you doing? Uh, and, you know, I was at their home, and it's like, you're, you know, what are you doing? This is not, you know, we should not be spending $900. Um, but it's, you know, it's, there's definitely something that unbalances uh, that the health of the individual. Um, and I really believe that, you know, people will, you know, uh, if you provide something that's entertaining or provide some other benefits, you know, they're going to they're gonna come to you and you really don't need to design these uh, Skinner boxes that in the, end, in the end just, you know, puts you on a blacklist and gets you regulated like, um, you know, like the gambling industry. Mm -hmm. So I'm just, I'm curious why you asked the question because if you're dealing with a, a game architecture that you've bolted onto something and it's not working, which, by the way, 95% of the people I've talked to about gamification are dealing with exactly that issue. They're like, but well, we hired programmers and we, you know, we put the leaderboard up and so on. It isn't pixie dust. You can't just sprinkle it on something and expect it to work, as Gabe Zickerman loves to say. He's, he's right. It, it's a difficult, hard challenge to make this work. And so we do have new tools here, and when they work, they're really powerful. But it's still an art. And there, 
And it's fun. Because it's it's fun. becoming a science slowly <laughs> over time. But but um, but it, yeah, don't underestimate what Byron said. It, it's hard work still mm -hmm. to make the alignment between the behavior you're trying to get in the real world and what the tools are that you're going to use to incentivize and motivate those behaviors. An example I like to share is, um, you know, back in the day when we used to, remember when we used to milk cows instead of clicking on them? <laughs> you know, there was inherent engagement in the task. You know, you could see if you were on target, the pail would fill with milk, you could talk and help your coworkers. And at the end of the day, those pails felt heavy as you carried them back to the barn. All sources of wonderful, natural engagement. Uh, but something gets lost in translation when work went virtual and sort of mouse driven. And so there's this uh, interesting opportunity to like really go into like what, uh, you know, what, what can make these uh, mechanics much more, uh, much more interesting uh, and, uh, and part of, the, part of the real world. What other, uh, other yes? Question around measurement is I think that's a very important part of games. I think it's mm -hmm. thinking mostly of the professional space but maybe social as well. Something like a sales, uh, you know, sales job is, is probably easy to think of measurement selling like one pair of jeans is going to be the same as another. But for something where there's qualitative difference between the task, you know, selling insurance policies or mortgages or doing, um, offering legal advice, something like that, is there a ceiling to where these kind of services can be offered such that you can only really measure performance on certain kind of tasks and other things have these complex qualitative measures, or is it just that we're uh, thinking too simplistically about how we might get a point? Hmm. Now you're talking about measurement of the, um, the effectiveness of the design or of the behavior of the player? And, uh, measuring sort of the success of the player, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're getting a point for selling something or finishing a call, uh, you know, how do you measure the quality of that call? Right, like, yeah, yeah. Point? Well, it means a great example, like, you know, hey, you know, you, can, you just put a, uh, like, how many calls I make a day, return a day? And then so you're going to have people calling and hanging up, calling, hanging up, you know, they're going to just to get the number of things. But or length of call, you know, the, the game is done the way. So, so there's a whole menu of things that, that come into play, though, when you think about that. And, and uh, the games are going to work the best in cases where there are, is quantitative information that can be uh, fed back in multiple time domains. But in a call center, there's a lot of stuff. There, there, there are moment-by-moment -moment CSETs, uh, uh, customer satisfaction surveys that are being input. You could do voice stress analysis. You've got a clock running on uh, call handling duration. Uh, you've got uh, 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 points that maybe a team is uh, accumulating uh, based on uh, uh, how the team action is doing. And one, one of the greatest things that actually happens in, 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 a, in a place like this, whenever you have a behavior or a piece of work that is important but is unrecognizably important because it's so small, like turning the lights out and the glaciers in Antarctica are, you know, that's a long causal chain there. But you can, you can give recogni recognition for that if you can find some metrics. So in the call center example, it brings up the, the issue of what is it exactly that, that we want people to be doing? What are the behaviors? What could we bring in here that could be automatically assessed? Maybe, maybe you could look at, uh, and these are all things that are being done. Look at facial expressions. Uh, uh, I mentioned analyzing voice. Uh, Looking at pacing, uh, there's there's good research that if, if my uh, the pacing of my if if I match my pacing to your pacing in a conversation, you will like me more. You know things like that. So you can find ways to bring these things in, just like in the games. Put them in a dashboard; they're instantly recognizable. It's not that you're uh, interfering too much with the task, but the ga the games bring up the point of what is it that we need to be measuring. The most interesting metric I've seen, or that I've been playing with, is uh, something that Intuit did, which is the, I think it's like the net referral score, which is something about, you know, how likely you would be to refer a friend or maybe actually measure that behavior. So after the call, how likely is that customer, I mean, how many of those customers actually bought again, or some other behavior thing might be, because it just does, it links it back to some business goals. Mm -hmm. the, the, yes. Oh, sorry, Mark, go ahead. Just to touch a little more on the level of complexity in a task and to what degree you can score higher complexity stuff. Um, there's interesting work out there uh, being done by colleagues at NASA and also uh, Nicky Couture and his team at Carnegie Mellon um, that shows that, yeah, if you can decompose a task well enough, and a whole lot of this comes down to task decomposition, but if you can break down a high-level, high-skill task well enough, you can get really good traction um, on, on, and really good results on, on that basis. So I just point you to that work to look at if you're looking at how to measure complex and, tasks. Yeah, and the, the, another thing too is it's easy to think about competition, but we forget the Latin roots of that word, which really means to come together to better ourselves, to, and again, you know, by pursuing the same goal. Yeah. 
And so a lot of uh, me mechanics tend to be, you know, win, lose, you know, but uh, my favorite restaurant in Oakland, one of my favorites is Petros, and they pool their tips. Great service because at the end of the day, you know, it's basically everybody's taking care of everybody. I, I, I have a question regarding the realness of data that is used in a, in a corporate game. Uh, as context, one of my companies is developing environmental sustainability solutions, and we in turn are putting more and more gaming behavior and challenge, challenges into it. There's sort of two solutions we, we could imagine. In one case, you're using the actual latest data from the company's meters and figuring out what your footprint is and how things have changed, or you could switch it so it, you're dealing with a hypothetical world to learn from when you are doing doing the gaming, in which case it's more like some of the games that I see on, on Facebook in which you're learning about the impact of different sustainability initiatives. And so I'm curious, in in the corporate games that each of you are, are, are dealing with, uh, in, what, in, in what cases is real data being used, in what cases is hypothetical data being used, and what kinds of lessons learned or conclusions are, are being drawn by the companies that, that apply to these games? I've got a really quick answer to that because I was just talking to representatives of a foreign government two days ago who were saying, you know, we, we've been doing everything metrics based and, and the thing is people just make up metrics to fill in the forms because they know that they're being graded on whether they fill in the forms that have the metrics or not and so we know that the metrics are rubbish. Um, Any time that people have to actually write something down or fill out a form, you're on the wrong track. You they'll need, they'll you game need, the system, is that yeah. what you're saying? Yeah. But, but you're also, you're now two or three layers away from reality. Mm -hmm. You need some way of just, uh, uh, you need a sensor in the environment that can just track people's behavior mm -hmm. to just see, did somebody or did somebody not do that? And if they have to think about it, if they have to fill out a form, if they have to record somewhere that they did something, you're already on the wrong mm -hmm. track. Yeah, if you, um, if you simplify the world, you, you, know, you clarify your goals, you, sus you, um, you amplify the feedback. The fourth thing is you also want to suspend consequences. And the more you suspend the consequences, the more playful it is, and then you can pull that in the fantasy, and that's what you might want to do for more dangerous stuff. You know, stuff that's a little bit more outside of their box, or you know, stuff that's a little bit more far afield. And that might help um, you know, those kinds of problems, make them more fantasy, uh, and then take the stuff that's a little bit more pedestrian and kind of accomplishable and put that more in the real world. So when you mentioned the corporate games, is there a link to the SAP system in the back that's doing the company's accounting and the gaming <laughs> yes. Yeah. I'm always curious what the answer is. Yeah. No. I, I think the answer is that, that there needs to be. There. There are a lot more learning and training games than there are actual work productivity games because it's just easier data and it's the only data we can get to right now. But the the real opportunity here is is to apply this sensibility to the actual interactions. I mean, why allow people to just have fun and have a playful. Uh, engaging orientation just to learning and training to go be bored to tears when 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 they leave the training room why not actually bring that into the game and say yeah uh, nice to have you working at our call center uh, sit down here and start playing when you get to level seven we'll let you talk to real customers and uh, when you get to level 14 we'll let you you know, uh, you know run a group or, or whatever it is so actually doing it in the work context I think is where the real advantage is and that's just a redesign of work it's a little bit harder with respect to tying it into the uh, to, to the actual metrics, but you're right on the right track. It's, uh, you know, Salesforce, SAP, Oracle, they've all got uh, uh, calls out now that, that you could actually feed uh, this information into games and be incredibly influential, we think, uh, uh, by bringing that stuff to light. We're playing with that blur and uh, with, uh, with uh, Flip, you know, with, with Tilt, Flip's Adventure uh, in 1.5 Dimensions, where you've got the cell phones. We're working with the Vermont uh, Energy Investment Company. And uh, we're, we're designing this game. It's in prototype stage, so it's real, real early. But we're doing this AR, which means alternate reality or augmented reality. And uh, you basically can tag, uh, you know, you can do an energy audit. We're going to crowdsource an energy audit for buildings. So you can, like, tag those light bulbs as part of a game. It goes into a database. Then people can whatever. And then there can be a layer of fantasy. And I, when, I rec when I do serious games, it's I recommend that layer of fantasy sort of be optional. So some people can be like, you know, I don't really want to be in the fantasy part, but and then some people can go, well, they'll get dressed up, they'll put in the, you know, they'll put on the lab coats, they'll put on the hat, the funny hats, and they'll just go have fun for the weekend, right? And other people will be much more serious about it, but allowing that range because not everybody really feels comfortable uh, playing. One thing I should mention about platforms we haven't really talked about, but the mobile phone is an amazing, is going to be an amazing, uh, very disruptive force. I don't know if it's clear to you, but right now we have over 5.6 billion mobile phones on the planet.
planet, cell phones. There are more, um, and that's 3.7 billion uh, cell phone owners. There are more cell phones on this planet today than there are FM radios. It is the most pervasive technology, you know, communication technology device uh, ever manufactured, and it's gotten there uh, to be that in, in 10 years. Compare that to like a gaming consoles, which is only like 1.1, 1.2 billion. Uh, you have gaming consoles, handheld consoles, and that's only if you count everything from 1975 to today. There may be 400 million people playing on Facebook, but there are 500 million smartphones, and that's only in three years. So when we think about gaming and you think about building your future businesses, be sure to remember that you know, we're really going to ubiquitous models where these things are lightweight, they've got a camera on them, they know where you are, there's all kinds of new things, new ways you can blend real world into that, um, into whatever you know, kind of game or task you want. Does anybody have a, just real quick, a, a challenge? I want to test these people with something, you know, what's yeah, tough? Right. Spending 900 bucks on virtual goods. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's pretty cool. Does anybody think they have a really tough challenge for this crew? Okay, gosh, we've got lots of tough challenges. Right. Um, I mean, we haven't done anything on this side, so please. Okay, uh, we talked about social fun and people fun. Yes, people fun, yeah. So in Japan, there's the yes. most successful social game, social mobile game. Yeah. Largely, it shows that users um, play with strangers a lot. Yes, yeah, yeah. But my theory is that in the U.S., at least, you have to play with actual friends in order to increase their user attention. Uh -huh. so, so what do you think? Is there a cultural difference? Or uh, is my theory wrong? Or, uh, and, so the, uh, and before we jump in, yes. we've got 10 minutes, and we've okay. got at least four questions. Right. And I want to get to everybody, okay. maybe five questions. There we so go. There we go. two minutes per. <laughs> Wow. All right. Yes. So um, that's yeah. That is a very good question. I need to know a little bit more about the game in Japan compared to here. Uh, there's, but basically, uh, the research that we've done it has been mostly U.S. We have done some pilots in Korea, uh, but we have not run you know studies in Japan. I think that there is an interesting. There is definitely a, an interesting social uh, modifier that it does allow you to be social. Um, in um, uh, it does allow there's some interesting cultural there are some interesting cultural differences that I think um, that I do think uh, factor into what might make things um, the most the most interesting, but uh, I need to know a little bit more about the game like what the mechanic is. Yeah, talk to me later. That'd be great. Your next door neighbor, please. Well, I have a challenge for you. So you talk about serious fun. Yeah. Um, and I figured that so when you're trying to develop a game mm -hmm. or even an app that has some fun element to influence behavioral change. Right now the trend seems to be like give them a badge, some fun badge. Right, but you're very good. The, the badge yeah. mechanic is the most popular. It's right. not the only but one. But how do you develop a more personal metric uh -huh. to motivate that person? Right. So, so all of you guys have kind of communication psychology and also research and industry background here. Mm -hmm. So how would you do that? How would you even go about thinking right. how to develop a yeah, I have, an, I have an undergraduate from Stanford, actually, in COGSI, and uh, I also took uh, a film, film production here and uh, also some programming courses, so that's kind of where I, where I come from. And what we, with serious fun, it definitely, badges are definitely a big part of it, but it's collection, completion mechanics. It's also repetition and rhythm, so dancing games, music games, change how I feel, think and behave, so those can be very, and repetition and rhythm, so it's setting up a pattern over time. And those can be very, you know, that can, that can change your mood. That, that can be very good. And then anything that where you, all games teach. And so really giving you something to think about after the, the play is really important. Why a badge works is because it makes, you know, fear, like, yes, I just won. That, that emotion dies down, um, goes away. And so it's nice to win a prize. So serious fun is all about what that prize is. And it can be a mental prize. It can be all kinds of things. But it doesn't have to be special. Huh? The economics of rarity doesn't work anymore. Exactly, yeah. exactly. I, I think one of the things you want to build in there is just a research layer where you can actually profile individual players and run constant A-B <laughs> split tests to see who responds to what. And then you get a much quicker, much better sense of is a bigger badge going to work for this person? Is something more colorful work for that person? Is something more personal work for this person? And you also get a, a much better sense of what's driving individual people, which of the different dimensions uh, that people play games for is the one is the reason that that player is playing the game. But you can also and put I, it right. And I don't in. want to fail in my task here, so yeah. let's make sure. I'm just going to sweep around. I see at least these three. So let's start here. Yes. How do you use gamification to basically incentivize people to do things that they don't want to do, like carpooling? So how do you incentivize drivers? <laughs> I, I love this defini definition of gamification. Yeah. <laughs> let's use games to do do things people don't want to do. <laughs> Well, yeah. I think you can't do that. I mean, it, and it's taking the portfolio of ingredients that we've all talked about, 
Uh, first of all, it's understanding what is the behavior that you, you want changed, what, the, what are the motivations intrinsic and extrinsic associated with that, those behaviors, why is it hard, uh, you know, what do you want people to do, how much, uh, how much it, is it an individual uh, experience versus a social experience. I mean, the badge may only work if I can show it to my friends. It's, I don't care about the badge, but if I can show it to my friends and I get, so it, it's, it's really, I, I think it would work in there. In fact, we've got two or three projects within this large grant, game grant project uh, at Stanford that it's, it's looking at transportation and carpooling. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, a, an engineer on campus, uh, Balaji Prabhakar, that has uh, done uh, uh, exactly the gamification uh, uh, idea that you, you mentioned uh, for uh, transportation in India with great success. We ran, a, we ran a pilot for a driveless challenge in Mountain View run by Adina Levin, and uh, we just said, you know, hey, let's, let's just take, take photos. Take photos of what you're doing. You know, put a tag for the game on Twitter. We scrape them. We put them up on a website, and you know, it you know it adds some fun to the game. There's also much. There's many more things that they're doing, but I'd recommend looking up her work. Molly, you had something to add there. Just I think also looking at what is the what is the key reason that they don't want to do it in the first place, and addressing that. I think carpooling is a is a great example because there are so many emotional tie-ins. The car is our identity. How do you use identity then? You know, the American identity. How do you how do you create the same kind of um, I'll use the word um, compulsion that we now have to recycle. Um, if there's a, not a place to recycle, I, I feel like something's wrong because I've been trained yeah. Yeah. over time, and it's it's cultural, it's social. It's a, you feel social disgust in the technical social term. disgust. Yeah, that's what uh, I feel. throwing something away in the trash which should be recycled. You eventually you eventually tip over, and we get trained to move it. Yeah. Please. Uh, a little bit similar, but from a corporate standpoint, um, I'd love to hear any examples or any ideas you have that in a corporation, if you're trying to incentivize employees to volunteer, to give more of their time, so it's for the greater good, um, what would be some strategies that you could look at? Or are there companies out there? Are there some good examples of companies who are doing this? Yeah, there are. Here, this is the red team. This is the blue team. I wonder who's going to have the most volunteer. Now that, that would be yeah. Then, then that's um, a, that, that's a head, head and, competition. And, yeah, and and executing that with a, a, a lot more style than I just mentioned. But that's that's one way to do it. Providing transparency for for that. Uh, uh, providing uh, virtual recognition for that. Uh, creating. Uh, ways in which you can instantiate the success, uh, not the failure, uh, that doesn't work as well, but the success of, of, the, of the two teams. Uh, I mean, it's just all, the, all these different ingredients. There are specific examples. There's a health uh, care, large health care plan that's uh, uh, using game mechanics to uh, uh, look, do uh, 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 employee volunteer uh, right now with, with success. I would, I, would, I would just take up a big whiteboard, draw a line down the center. And on one hand, put um, social emotions involved with volunteering. So generosity, gratitude, you know, the feeling of elevation when you see some human act of human kindness. And on the other half of the board, put mechanics. These are things that you can do. Uh, in a, you know, a game like World of Warcraft, you, know, you, get, you get a health, a health pack. And if I give it to you, I feel generous, you feel gratitude. You might feel elevation seeing human kindness. And then later in the game, you, know, you, you can give it back to me or you know, something like that. And then that, those emotions kind of roll you know, roll through the game. So you want to think on that other side, like what, what kinds of actions would then get us to that, um, those different emotional states? I'm reading a book right now called Zilch by Nancy <laughs> Lublin that uh, is lessons from the nonprofit world for for-profit, for the for-profit world. And uh, how do you motivate people in a context where you don't have effectively money and power? They're volunteers and you need to motivate them. And they talk about how do you bring um, uh, nonprofit activities into for-profit and how do you get people to do that? It's, it's an interesting, I'm enjoying it. It's an interesting book and it's not exactly to your point, but it's a lot of the same. How do you, how do you motivate people to do things where it's not about tying their pay to it? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Where do you see games interacting with healthcare? How could it help a lot? Wow. How could it help you should, a lot? You should uh, come visit our lab. We've got three whole projects going on mm -hmm. that topic. For, uh, for games, uh, one of the, has anyone played Brain Age on the Nintendo DS? What was really interesting about that particular game is you play, it's basically, it's almost, it's, it's almost math flashcards, but a little more sophisticated. You, you write down um, the multiplication, and they've got little number games and stuff like that. What's fascinating about that design, and I think it's uh, the two things. One is that there's a social UI. There's a little character that says, yay, good job, or whatever. But then the other thing is that you can only, do, you, if you do three of the challenges, uh, you'll actually get a little stamp that you get to put on that calendar, like, yes, I got a stamp today. And you get to design the stamp. You, can, you get to place the stamp. 
But if you play that, the, that challenge a second time in that day, you, don't, you get you score, but you don't get credit. And so to level up in that game, you have to come back. It rewards you for coming back every day. And so just by designing that, that kind of design over time, then that's what builds a habit. So it's not like I played Brain Age for five hours and I leveled up because you actually won't, that won't do as much as doing 15 minutes every day. Yeah, there's, so, a, there's a customer of ours, uh, Hope Lab, who is... Oh, uh, yeah, they're uh, amazing. They're doing some great stuff. They have a, Health Hero, there's lots of great stuff. Yeah, Zamzi is a, a product for, for kids who are having weight problems and it actually tracks their activity level during the day. At night, they plug their pedometer in and they get to use the credits they've earned during the day for all of their activities to interact socially. So really okay. tying in what kids want to do with what they might not be mm -hmm. inclined to do to uh, create this feedback loop and then train them uh, over time. They've seen, I think, a 30% increase uh, in activities for kids involved in this program. Uh, yeah, if you I'll haven't seen one, them, that's One uh, uh, area that I think is going to be really <laughs> ripe for a lot of uh, commercial activity and startup activity, and that is the general area of compliance. You know, 25 to 40 percent of prescriptions that are written are, are not filled or are, are medicines not taken properly on time. Uh, this is a huge issue, perhaps, you know, I, some I argue even word. one of the most important issues. A lot of game mechanics can be applied uh, to that if executed well. Yeah, so and, if you, and, if you apply, and if you apply to that, you want to look at that, that core word, compliance. What? What? I mean, it's like, you know, I'm telling you what to do. You, want, you need to comply to my rules. That's not very, that's not game thinking, right? That's not very, that's not very playful. So think about, you know, start there and then, you know, design your game, your game from that. It's not comply. We want to, you know, so you're not someone saying, you must do this, but do something that makes it, because uh, people are saying no, don't want to like, don't want to fit in that box. But Just if you're starting a ways. company, say the word compliance. Yes, yeah, actually funding, yeah, yeah funding is very good. And, yeah, exactly. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, actually, when the, everything coming out of my mouth from the designer perspective, that's, that's me. Um, I think we're, we're out of time. I'm going to ask one, I have the, the luxury, I guess, of asking one last question, and that is, look, 20 years down the road, will we be sitting here talking about a set of tools called game dynamics, or will this be all so integrated into the fabric of everything we do that it'll just be part of it? It won't be a separate toolbox. It'll just be part of the fundamental place we start. The latter. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. There's no question in my mind, like I said earlier, is that games, uh, well, games are the medium for the 21st century. And games are really taking interface design to that next, interaction design to that next level. Mm -hmm. uh, the stuff that we think and learn about as, you know, H in HCI, human interaction, you know, UI design, all of that's going to be taken to that next level. Just like, you know, film introduced two technologies, you know, the frame for attention and the cut to compress time to increase mm -hmm. emotional engagement. Well, games added choice. And we've had 35 years of inventing this language of games, just like there's a language of cinema. We're not done yet with the language of games, but it's going to go right into interaction design, and you're not going to see it as, as a separate discipline. Well, I'd like to thank all of you for your attention and your questions, and Molly, Nicole, Mark, Byron, thanks uh, for your time and thoughts. It's fascinating, and I hope you all do good work in this area. Great.